The Yankees have lost a ton of pitching already here in this offseason. So what happens now? You are Locked On Yankees, your daily New York Yankees podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Yankees, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks so much for making us your first listen every day. Of course, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Thanks again for joining the show today. I'm Steve Granato. For our everydayers out there, no Stacey Gatsoulias today. Stacey is on vacation. So so you're hanging out with me here today and coming up on today's show we have a whole bunch of fun we need to talk about this billy mckinney trade that happened here over the last couple of days for a strange return the yankees did something with that return again we're going to get into that a little bit later and take a look at some of the recent transactions they've done on the smaller side of things that's much later on in the show but first we have connor foley our old friend he covers the scranton wilkesbury rail riders for the times tribune out in music uh, he joins the show here today. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff, mostly about pitching here today. We'll also get a little bit into Oswald Peraza, what he thinks the organization views Oswald Peraza, especially right now, given all the moves that they have had and a whole bunch of really cool stuff we get into here today. So let's go ahead and get to that conversation now with Connor Foley of the Times Tribune. Connor Foley, Times Tribune, chatting with us today here. Uh, a lot of rail rider stuff I wanted to get into. And of course, that means depth. Uh, about the Yankees in 2024. But before we get to that, you saw uh, some of the guys that got sent off for the Juan Soto deal. So I'm very curious. I say overpay uh, for what you get back because of the short term of this thing. Um, but once you saw the uh, the results of the trade, where was your head at? I think King was probably the hardest one to stomach just because of what the Yankees saw in the small, in the small sample with him as a starter last year and it kind of allowed you to really dream on what he could be um we saw that in the minor leagues when he first broke in he was just this guy back then he was you know whipping out the maddox front hip two seamer and just baffling hitters back then and then you know i texted him last year i was like can you imagine telling that guy that this version of michael king is hitting 98 and sometimes 100 out of the bullpen um so i think obviously that one is the big one that that has the most potential to hurt just because we've seen that he can do it. Um, Randy Vasquez, Johnny Brito, uh, both, you know, had flashes at AAA last year. I wouldn't say that either one particularly dominated the level. Um, Brito was kind of that similar, like you could, you could dream on some things just because that change up. And then you saw what he did out of the bullpen for them. And even if at worst you're getting like this really good, bullpen dude who comes in throwing a ton of change-ups and is you know really successful that way like that's a really valuable piece to have and then Vasquez has you know he had stuff to burn like he had everything that you could ever want and it's kind of just a matter of like all right when these guys put it together uh first of all when will that be and then how good of a pitcher is that going to be that's still a lot of question marks with those guys there's a lot of control there, obviously, though. So if you're going like the, is this a strict overpay just because we have these guys for so much longer than the Yankees are going to have Soto? Sure. Like, that's one thing. But you have Aaron Judge. You have Garrett Cole. They're in their primes. You have to do something to maximize these years because, you know, there's a chance that those contracts get ugly when those guys get old. And so you have to take your best shot right now. And the best shot was going to be to get Juan Soto, who – like, yeah, he's only here for a year, but he's a generational dude. He's like on a Hall of Fame track. So you, you kind of have to pay that high price. And who knows? Maybe you can, maybe he has a great year in New York. He loves it there. And then you sign him. And now you've locked up a guy who's going to be 26 in that year. And you have him for long term. And then you like have a real crazy core that you can build around. Sure. Uh, we say it a lot here on Locked On Yankees. You got to give something to get something. And like you kind of dove in a little bit there on what they gave up to get Juan Soto. Of course, it wasn't just Juan Soto. It was the Verdugo deal, too. You lose Greg Weiser. You lose Richard Fitz, who you never got a chance to actually see in right. Scranton. Uh, but it wasn't even just that. A guy you did see, you lose Mitch Spence to the Rule 5 draft. 
Uh, you lost a couple. You lost Matt Sauer in the system to the Rule 5 drafts. In a span of about 48 hours, you lost like nine pitchers, um, which is pretty significant. So when you're looking at the 2024 Rail Riders here as of this recording on December the 15th to be released in a couple of days, uh, your head when it comes to the state of AAA pitching, especially for the Yankees, because, I mean, past Beater, past Warren, it's a lot of question marks right now. Yes. However, those first two are like, that's a pretty good place to start. Especially, you know, Warren had this crazy finish to the year that, you know, I think some people were real were recognizing it, but like, it was crazy. That dude was awesome. And you could see him kind of level up at that point. And I'm excited to see just how much higher he can go after like getting to that level. And now he knows that he can pitch a triple A and now let's like, let's go all the way. Let's make it to the majors kind of thing with him. Um, Beater, you know, same way. I think he probably would have liked to have a little bit stronger finish in AAA just because he got some home run stuff. Um, you know, there was one game where uh, he didn't do too great at the end. And I went in the clubhouse afterward to talk to him. And he's like, all right, make you like, get me ready for New York. Like, give me the hard questions. Cause like, he's, that's just the mindset that he's in right now is he knows that he wants to be ready to be in the majors next year. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I think the, the thing with him is you'd like to see uh, like the big pitch count innings go away a little bit uh, just cause he is a strikeout dude. Uh, and he walked, but he walks, a, let's say he probably walks a few too many. But those are two really good places to start. And a lot of times when the Yankees go through these off seasons and trade people, you kind of learn where their heads are in terms of how they value their own prospects. And, you know, did Will Warren's name ever come up in these trades? Like, did Beater's names ever come up in these trades? Like, the fact that the rumors weren't even out there kind of tells me that they really like these guys and they're protecting them and not even letting their names get out. I'm not saying that their names are actually in there, but you know what I mean? Um, and then, you know, so I was kind of thinking at the end of the season, like, you know, Brito's going to be back here. Vasquez is going to be back here. Warren's going to be back here. Beater, maybe Spence. Where does that leave these guys who had double A who spent pretty much the whole year at double A? There wasn't a lot of like, movement from tampa to double a like those guys who were there got in a lot a lot of work at double a so that you like that log jam had to be cleared up somehow they did deal a lot more from like the triple a versus the double a but it's you know the yankees have kind of shown that even though you know people probably wouldn't credit them with developing an ace out of their system they turn out like quality pitchers like at a crazy rate right now that uh you know it's pretty impressive considering how far they've come in this regime of you know sam breen and before him when desi was working in the system like they've really got something going right now and uh i'm not going to count them out when it comes to developing depth yeah and especially considering how they're able to do it at the major league level too like not to just be like all 100 percent behind the yankees here obviously they had their issues last season and we're not saying that but i mean it was almost like a plug and play situation last year where it just worked uh, okay. especially when it came to the bullpen you're just like all right like throw a dart at the board and it hits this guy in the noggin and you pick him and he ends up going you know yeah. six shutout or whatever like wow, wow how did that happen yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that definitely happened last season a lot. And I, I, to your credit, I mean, I saw, I saw it for only one season, but you've been around Sam Breen a lot more, um, and you've seen how they develop pitching and Graham Johnson obviously has been there for a couple of seasons with the rail riders. So I can imagine you've seen uh, it, it a lot more, how they're able to kind of get the most out of guys. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they definitely have. And I think it's a lot about, um, working to guys strengths a lot. And, you know, I know that they're, was it last year or the year before that was the year of the sweeper with the Yankee system. I think it goes beyond that. Like they just, whatever these guys do well, that's what they're going to focus on. And they're going to build off of what happens. They're going to build off of that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, you know, it's, it's Ryan Weber even, you know, like 
here's a guy who's been in several teams throughout his career, bounced around, doesn't throw that hard, hits like 90, and the Yankees get useful innings out of him. Like, that's crazy. Uh, but that's kind of where they are right now. But, you know, Ian Hamilton, they pick him up, was it right before spring training? And then he's a really important member, piece of their bullpen. Uh, so, you know, I think they've kind of earned the benefit of the doubt, even though, again, like they're not producing that ace dude. Uh, but that's, you know, how many people are producing an ace at this point. Score this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Guys, you guys already know FanDuel is a household name, so you're going to want to get in on the action already. Right now, new customers are going to get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 when your team wins. And if you've been thinking about it for a while, you've heard the name, obviously, FanDuel's all over the place. Now's the time. This is the chance to join in right now. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Of course, the app is super easy to use. There's a whole bunch of betting options in there. Spreads, player props, over-unders. And, of course, you can combine prop bets into a single-game parlay for a whole bunch of fun. You should check it out. Download the app today. And just if you're curious, the Yankees are not favored to win the World Series. They have some of the best odds, plus 850. But they are favored to win the American League. So check it out. They're at plus 450 right now uh, to win the American League pennant. So again, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season as well. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Yeah, uh, we were talking about that the other day on the show, as a matter of fact, just like the lack of aces in baseball is definitely, I wouldn't say an issue, but it's definitely a trend, uh, the lack of true aces. Um, and that's, you know, when you have a Garrett Cole in your in your back pocket, you're going like, wow, it truly is a blessing to watch him work every night. Um, right. One of those types that you saw a flash of, you didn't get to watch personally, what was Drew Thorpe, uh, we mentioned, uh, obviously was in the Juan Soto deal. And that was one of the guys that was on my do not trade list. Uh, we said about two days before he was, in fact, traded. Do you, from from the guys you've seen, is is do you have a short list of guys where even before the Juan Soto deal, you're going like, don't get rid of this guy. Obviously, you kind of alluded to the Warren and Beater aspect of where their heads might be at, but where your head is at, a guy who doesn't have affiliation with the team but watches them regularly. Do you have a no trade list? Man, that's tough. I mean, I think, I mean, Dominguez is the easy answer um, in what he was able to do at a short time at AAA and just the fact that he's so young and I mean, he's really played a lot of baseball uh, over the last few seasons. And like the fact that he wasn't worn down by that and that he just kept getting better. Like, that's pretty impressive. Um, so to see him go out for Tommy John, like that's, that's tough. Um, but he probably would have been honest again, like it's who, who are you trying to get kind of comes to mind uh, in terms of like, who's, untouchable um but you know wells certainly had like you can see like what the yankees like about him in terms of his approach at the plate you can see that warren i would have been very hesitant to deal warren i think just because of when he turned that corner in the middle of the year like that was that was something special like you're counting on seven innings which is you know, that's kind of unheard of and it's ground balls and it's strikeouts. And, you know, I think he's kind of, I think he's still getting better. Like he's, he wasn't even rule five. Like they didn't have, they don't have to protect him until next year, I think. So that's, even though he's a triple a, he's still really young in his career. Um, but again, it's for me, a lot of it depends on who am I getting and to get Soto. I think I'm okay with paying the price. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, it wouldn't be us having you on the show without us saying the biggest name always. And that name is Oswald Peraza. We're talking trade stuff here again today. And look, I, I think you're in the same camp as I am the same camp that Stacey's in. We love Oswald. We think he's great. We think he deserves a chance. Um, your reaction to the DJ LeMay, he was the third baseman, no ifs, ands, or buts news. 
Um, did you think that was a little premature because Stacy and I were going, uh, you didn't want to at least wait till spring training to see what you got here. Um, it felt a little premature on our end. Um, well, I mean, LeMay has already got the contract, so I'm sure that plays into it. You have to play him somewhere with Oswald from like the offensive profile of third base. I don't want him to be something that he's not at the plate and I don't I don't know that he, you know with third base comes power expectations not to say that he can't hit home runs he's shown that he can but I would rather him like not be counted on as being this you know 20 homer dude at third base when he's hardly played at the major league level before kind of thing um you know defensively sure he can play anywhere right now and he'll be awesome there um he might even i mean <laughs> it's hard to say anybody could be better than Volpe after the dude just won a gold glove uh but i think oswald's probably right on his level in terms of playing shortstop um but i I've think i've come that, out and said it connor I've, i i won't mince the words i think oswald's a better defender than anthony Volpe, but that's yeah. you know we're splitting hairs but you know i think he's yeah. better defensively yeah, I think I'm in. I think I'm on that in that camp with you, uh, which is insane me. to say. Because, like you said, he just yeah. won a Gold Glove in his rookie gold season. Glove. Yes, yeah. like that's not. Uh, I say it every time. This always is the caveat. Like that's not to take anything away from Anthony Volpe, but that's I right. think that just shows how good we think Oswald Peraza is. That's right, and a lot of it to me is like it even just comes down to just arm strength. Like that Oswald's arm is insane, and he makes these throws look so easy. Uh, when you know what they're not so yeah so he Oswald hasn't had a ton of time at the majors he deserves more time at the majors um I just don't know if you know from an offensive profile whether third base is the right place for him right off the bat I would hope that he's more of like a contact maybe runs into 10 15 homers kind of guy that probably plays better at a shortstop or even a second base kind of thing. Yeah. But defensively he can play at least That's anywhere right. on the left side of the infield, save first yeah. base. And I'm sure if you gave him a first baseman's glove, he'd probably figure it out too. Yeah, I mean, um, he barely played, he barely played third base. And when he yeah. went up to the majors, like he's making it look easy. Um, I'm curious. I want to ask you about this. This was a sticking point that Stacy and I have been on for a while. It was very clear last season that Josh Donaldson was not going to be their third baseman. Very clear, obvious mm -hmm. injuries aside. It just wasn't going to work yeah. at that point. Did you ever hear any discussions, whether on the record, off the record, whatever <laughs> of putting Oswald at third? Cause he played short basically all last season when it was very clear that Anthony Volpe was going to be the favorite shortstop. Do you have any idea why the Yankees did not put Oswald at third down in AAA? I don't, and I think it's because they kind of, from what I've gathered, they have a philosophy where if you can play short, you can play anywhere kind of thing, um, which might be fair. You know, the only thing you'd have to adjust to third base is probably the quickness of it, but, you know, short, you're making longer throws. Um, you have to move both directions a little bit more. Um I think you could probably like go down the line though. Cause I don't think Trey Sweeney played any other position, but shortstop last year. So they might just like having their uh, shortstop prospects stay at shortstop kind of thing. And uh, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think the guys who are super talented on defense, it probably doesn't matter as much to them. Like maybe if it's a shortstop guy who isn't as gifted with the glove and then, okay, yeah, we're going to, see what he can do at second. We're going to see what he can do at short or at third. Oswald, I don't think they were worried about that at all. So yeah, I think that's probably, probably why. That's what I figured. But still, like you said, the quickness, the, the glove hand side, uh, the deep throw and in, in foul territory, just all of it. Right. I just was like once a week, Saturdays, just, just to get him a couple looks over there before he gets to the major leagues and has to do it. Like, Again, yeah. I think the world of this kid's glove. Uh, but it was just bizarre to me that it was pretty obvious he's not going to play short right now. 
get him a look or two. Um, it just didn't make any sense to me. But yes, that's what I always figured. It's just like if you can play short, you can play anywhere and understand that. Um, but it doesn't hurt to get a few looks, man. Just, just take a few grounders type of thing. Um, but your thoughts here, one more uh, before I let you run today. Uh, your thoughts on just Oswald as a trade piece. Look, it's it's surrounded him for years uh, in his career. The Yankees need pitching. Corbin Burns might be available. Things like that. Um, is that a possibility in your mind where the Yankees finally pull the trigger or do you think they're holding on for dear life forever? Uh, do they think Oswald's legitimately going to be a part of their future? Because right now, it is not even a guarantee, even in the slightest, that he even makes the major league roster on opening day because of the log jam in the outfield that pushes Oswaldo Cabrera to the infield. So it's uh, it's murky for me. Uh, do you think he's going to be shopped? Um. All right, feel free to cut this out if my main premise is wrong, but I think he's out of options. So that's always hard to tell, by the way. Always hard to tell. It's hard to tell. He's but he's been healthy though. So I think like I think he's pretty much a a clear cut. Uh I think he's out of option. So first of all, that would say he's gonna be on the major league roster at some point. It also therefore when the Yankees lose that flexibility of being able to send guys up and down, sometimes that's a time when they decide to deal these guys, uh, or at least that's what it seemed like in the past. So, I mean, again, I love, I love Oswald. I love the guy that he is. I love the glove. It's a blast to watch him play. The Yankees though, you know, if they're looking at a guy who isn't going to be, a starter on their team who they have to keep in the majors can't send to the minors you know is he fully developed could he use more time in the minors it might mean that they're like ready or not ready but would they part with him probably at this point i don't know i have no idea i don't know what their thoughts are on him i know that you know there's people in the org who love oswald and you know why not uh he's great but, uh, you know, I could see it again, like you're trading for a Cy Young winner, right? So you have to give to get, right? Yeah. Yeah. Always uh, time will tell on this one. They've just been hanging on to him for so long. You're like, man, is this finally the time they actually do it? Because they're pretty all in on 24. And uh, from the outside looking in, it doesn't seem like Oswald Peraza is a big part of the Major League Club next season, even though he probably deserves to be. But that's just, uh, again, outside looking in. It's just call up Oswald. That's, 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 I think that's the that's the gist of this. Uh, Connor Foley does great work with the Times Tribune covering the Rail Riders. You can follow him uh, on Twitter, X, whatever you call it. It's in the episode description as always. Connor, love having you on the show, man. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Many thanks to Connor Foley again for joining the show here today. We really appreciate when he joins. You definitely should go check him out. Uh, links in the episode description. He does great work for the Times Tribune and covering the Rail Riders. So many thanks to Connor. Really appreciate it. Of course, every day is out there. Don't forget to check out Locked On Sports Today, 24-7 streaming YouTube channel. As you guys already know, if you need background sound, all that good stuff, uh, flip it on, check it out, see if you like it. Uh, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Uh, again, thanks for hanging out with us here today. Uh, no Stacy, just me. I guess Connor earlier too. But uh, we did have some stuff we needed to get to here today. Of course, the Yankees made a couple of moves this past Thursday, trading Billy McKinney to the Pittsburgh Pirates for international pool money. They got $500,000 for Billy McKinney. This was kind of strange, right? Because McKinney was just signed a couple of days prior to that trade. Uh, he was outrighted at the end of last season. He elected free agency, and then the Yankees signed him to a minor league deal, not a major league deal. And then, of course, right thereafter, ended up trading him to the Pirates for $500,000, specifically in international uh, pool money, which is really interesting in this case. Maybe not in other cases, but given the timing of this, really strange. So they traded him on Thursday. They had until Friday to use that money. So the 2023 international pool signing period ended on Friday. So just like 24 hours after they traded McKinney for that 500 K they had to spend it and they actually ended up doing it surprisingly enough. Um, so the Yankees ended up signing a 17 year old right-handed catcher from the Dominican Republic by the name of Justin Capayan. Uh, there is not a lot of information on him right now. 
He's a six-footer, young kid, of course, 17 years of age, and he had to be signed that day. Uh, he's likely to be in the complex league here at the start of the 2024 season. In all likelihood, that's usually where we see guys of this age go to to start their uh, minor league careers. So we can keep an eye out for that. Obviously, if things go well, he would move on to Tampa. Uh, anything further than that would be massive uh, and uh, kind of unprecedented. We'd see other guys do that. Of course, there were a couple of big names last season in the Padre system that ended up making waves early on, but uh, you don't anticipate that at this point. But again, catcher Justin Cape on right-handed hitter uh, from the Dominican Republic signs with the Yankees for $450,000. Uh, we saw that uh, report a couple of times. Jack Curry was the first to report it from Yes Network. But the uh, other strange thing, if you go to the Yankees transactions page, they have another international signing on there, uh, an outfielder by the name of Yael Zapata, but there is like basically no information on him um, I assume this is a big assumption on my part, so don't take this as Bible, but uh, I assume that's what the other $50,000, if they had no other money to spend, I don't know what the state of their international pool money was at that point. Um, I know they had added the 500000 from the McKinney trade, uh, but they spent four hundred fifty k on Capayon, and I assume, again, the rest of it, if not more, if they had any more, uh, to Yael Zapata. So two very small moves, obviously, at this point, but it was just kind of interesting to see the flip and how short of time they had, right? Kind of strange, but they ended up doing it anyway. Um, the Yankees obviously have been a little busy here recently. We kind of touched on it during the Connor Foley uh, conversation, but they did have a couple of moves here. The Yankees ended up signing Dwayne Underwood Jr., 29-year-old right-hander. Uh, we've seen him start. We've seen him relieve, most recently relieve in the majors. Uh, he struggled last year with the Pirates, so a lot of Yankees Pirates uh, going on right now. But uh, he pitched a little bit the Pirates, pitched a little bit in Indianapolis last season. That's their AAA affiliate. He is currently out of options. He is going to get a um, non-roster invite to spring training so he is uh, it is a minor league deal it is not a major league deal but he does get a spring training invite and you know if you're going oh, Dwayne Underwood you're looking at the numbers like oh six ERA five ERA and all these like bad bad numbers right uh the Yankees clearly aren't anticipating him being this massive piece to the bullpen he's not going to fight for closing time nothing like that uh but this is just one of those depth things the Yankees clearly have lost a whole bunch of depth uh, here over the last couple of days, a couple of weeks. So they very clearly have needed to add to that depth here. And this is just kind of one of those signings. The Yankees have a pretty decent track record, again, as we talked about with Connor Foley, of signing these guys that are, you know, kind of teetering in their careers and uh, end up finding something, some diamonds in the rough. So that's uh, clearly what they're hoping out of Dwayne Underwood Jr. He's a big ground ball pitcher. He's not a big strikeout guy. He kind of had trouble with walks here recently. So. Maybe they can fix some type of thing here for Dwayne Underwood Jr., but I wouldn't anticipate him being this big, big piece of the bullpen. Just more depth signings. Likely see him at AAA for the majority of next season. Um, the Yankees have added a couple of guys. Obviously, we we briefly touched on uh, Anthony Masevich here recently. Um, they also signed Dennis Santana, another right-hander, and Odaner Mosqueda, a left-hander. Some guys that kind of bounce around in their careers. Um, the Yankees have been signing as fully anticipated at this point. You're going to keep seeing these types of moves. Um, these are a lot of relievers at this point, but the Yankees are very clearly going to have to do something with starters. Uh, we kind of touched on it uh, again during the fully uh, interview, but uh, just as an aside, just as a, a reminder, just moving forward, you can kind of anticipate the Yankees to keep doing these types of things because of everything they lost in the Soto trade, in the Verdugo trade, and in the Rule 5 draft. So just some things to look out for here as you move forward. When you see these signings, don't think they're anything more than depth. Um, don't think, oh, this is going to be the Domingo Herman replacement. Uh, unless you see some of those bigger names go off of the board of the Yankees, obviously still targeting Yamamoto and things like that. Um, but for these smaller moves, these are your depth guys. These are your Johnny Britos. These are your Randy Vasquez's, your Ryan Weber's. Those types of guys are getting signed right now, which is uh, which is good. They need these guys because clearly you saw how it worked out last season, um, the types of guys that they need to call upon when there's an injury or more. Um, but that's basically it here. Uh, as a reminder, again, to our everydayers, we're kind of going through uh, phases of uh, – vacation time between Stacy and myself. Uh, Stacy will be back on Wednesday. I will be out of town on Wednesday. You will see us back together for our Fan Mail Friday episode, so make sure to check that out. Hit the subscribe button and join the Locked on Yankees Insiders Club 
as well. We'd love to have you aboard over there. 14 day trial in the episode description. So go check it out. And that's going to just about do it for today's episode of Locked On Yankees. I'm Steve Granado and Stacy will see you on Wednesday.